This model has worked for over a hundred years now, not quite, but close to a hundred years now. Many, many people have gotten sober. Many people have found community. Many people have worked through the process. Sober on Purpose friends, I wanted to back up and do a video around what most people think addiction is. And we're going to put this on the podcast too. So hello, Sober on Purpose podcast. Please join us over there. Please hit the like button below the subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. It's a simple task. Whatever I need to do, balloons, kisses, go ahead and hit the subscribe button below. So again, I'm Tanya with Tanya Joy Coaching and Sober on Purpose, and we're going to talk about addiction. Now, quite frankly, I have gotten some flack in calling it addiction or saying an addict. I want to be upfront. I don't intend to label anybody. And in almost every program I've run into, it is about self-labeling of deciding whether this is something that you need to deal with or not. So I leave that up to you. And we're going to do something kind of like Jeopardy. You get to pick the answer that you think best works for you, not the one that works for me. I'm going to give you three different thought processes. And actually, I'm going to look down and read a little bit um, about what addiction is or what it's not. Right? And you need to make the determination because here's what we know is anything in life, if you're not committed to doing it, it's probably not going to get done. And that's everything from choosing what you eat, where you work, where you live and who you choose to be with. So let's talk about addiction. The Around the late 1920s, 1930s was when um, Bill W. and Dr. Bob started Alcoholics Anonymous, and it came out of the Oxford group, which was a religious group. And they looked at it and they said, there's got to be a better way, because what they were doing basically is stuffing people who could not control their drinking or chose not to control their drinking. I have to be real careful with words here. They were putting them in insane asylums or, you know, they were being locked up in jail. There just was not really any methodology to deal with it. So as they began to look at it, what they were seeing was disease, dis-ease. And it's very common to think of this as a genetic predisposition, also an environmental uh, something that you learned, a behavior that you learned from parents, a behavior that you learned from aunts and uncles, um, something that you were in dis-ease, a disease, and then you began to drink to find comfort in that. So I'm going to read you directly what Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous defines addiction as a physical allergy, mental obsession, and spiritual malady, a dis-ease that leads the person to mood-altering using of alcohol. An alcoholic is never free from the disease, but can manage it like a diabetic manages their insulin. The disease idea blossomed with the advent of healthcare that could grasp and bill for a biological phenomenon labeled as a disease. Backed up by neuroscience that could point to the changes in the brain of a person with an addiction, this is the disease model and it is wild, widely accepted. So in the disease model, the person can't help themselves. They are always going to have it like you would have diabetes and they're never going to be free from it. And it's often why in alcoholics meetings, they'll stand up and say, hi, I'm Tanya, I'm an alcoholic. This model has worked for over a hundred years now, not quite, but close to a hundred years now. 
Many, many people have gotten sober. Many people have found community. Many people have worked through the press. And along with that came the Al-Anon group, Friends and Family of Alcoholics. And that group was supporting those five people who surround the one alcoholic. That method, that 12 step method, got taken over into multiple things. I mean, you can find it for shopping, for drugs, for food, for, you know, anything that um, makes your life feel out of control. That's another way to look at it. I'm giving up everything to do this. Phone addiction, um, video addiction, uh, sleep addiction. It could look anything like that. That 12 step model has been carried over to it. And we're going to look more deeply at the 12 steps. There's a lot of valuable things in there. The question really is, is this a disease or is this a disease model that the world could grasp onto? As we keep evolving step by step, learning more, understanding about neuroscience, because we're way past where we were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s with neuroscience. So there are a lot of things that are useful building on the AA Al-Anon model. Is it the model to continue with? Does it work for everybody? Always an interesting question. So you have the opportunity to look at this and say, yeah, this is a model that worked for me or this is a model that didn't work for me. One of the things that I found being a card carrying Al-Anon is that yes, I'm grateful for Al-Anon. I'm grateful for the community. I am grateful for every time a newcomer came in, shared their story, it brought me back to how far I had come. Was there a lot of growth beyond that? I, after about 10 years, found that I wasn't growing as much. So I will leave you to think about that. I highly recommend if you are in a situation where you have really isolated, that you seek out a community. And the one thing that you're gonna be surprised about in Al-Anon communities is the laughter. There's enormous laughter. I understand in AA, I've been to a couple mixed groups, so that's the same thing too. So that is the disease model. Now, in his book, Biology of Addiction, neuroscientist Mark Lewis defines addiction um, as the course of brain, of course the brain changes, but the way it has to change with learning and development is not disease. Lewis believes this is due to the brain's plasticity in the sense that it can change and maneuver and and that's how we've survived is is the ability to shift and think and adapt to our environment all repeated experiences change the brain add to the difficult emotional history add to sorry add to that difficult emotional history poor self-management, inability to release daily stress, and the habit of addiction is born. I would throw in their trauma. So difficult emotional history could be trauma, but poor self-management, inability to release daily stress. So the, the human does not have coping mechanisms for releasing the daily stress, and the habit of addiction is born. And what, what, what we're doing is we're reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. We're telling ourselves that I've had a hard day. I need a drink. I've um, had a hard day. I need to run five miles, 10 miles. All that kicks up um, the endorphins in the running. And then for the drinking, it does the dopamine. So as you look at the neuroscience behind this, there is good reason that we're doing these things. We're coping. So when you're looking at reinforcement is I'm telling myself a narrative, then I'm developing a relationship with a drug, a alcohol, a habit, um, even, you know, picking your fingers could be one of those habits. I'm developing this relationship and this relationship is relieving stress. So one of the things that loved ones of alcoholics do is trying to control the alcoholic relieves the stress. I don't know who I am if I'm not caring for you. What's my role in the world if I'm not caring for you? 
It's part of the relationship addiction cycle. So narrative, relationship, and then habit. And what we know is the mind can decide this is the default, ha default habit and we go on autopilot. If you've ever tried to create a habit or break a habit, you know that it can take multiple days to make that happen unless there's a particularly striking incident. So I, I tell this story of change can happen really quickly. You can make decisions really quickly if there is something truly negative happening. In college, I had eaten some canned crab, made a little crab salad. I didn't know that I was already really sick. I didn't know. Um, I began to show all kinds of symptoms, fever, vomiting, all of those things were happening to the point where I needed to go to the emergency doctor. They had to give me stuff to calm my stomach. But I have made the association and created the narrative that the canned crab made me sick. That's not true once I got to the doctor and figured that out, but my body still looks at that canned crab many, many years later and says, we've connected this narrative to this and we're not gonna do that. Now you may not can't like canned crab anyway, and, and that's just fine, <laughs> it's not the best thing out there, but creating that narrative connects it. So narrative, relationship, habit is formed. So I formed the habit of never eating canned crab. Whereas it could go the other way that the first time I had a drink, I felt better, I felt more relaxed, I was able to talk to people. And so I said, huh, let's repeat this. And then I began to repeat it to the point where my mind and my body said, if we don't have this, we can't do this correctly. So think about those connections in your life and if they are something that really has either a trauma background or some kind of bizarre connection background or a rinse and repeat that still doesn't make any sense. And it can go the other way. If I go out and cross country ski on a regular basis, I feel fired up, I feel ready to go. If I keep doing that over and over, my body says, hey, we're missing that, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. So I've created the narrative that, hey, it really helps for me to get my blood flowing, get some exercise going, created that relationship between exercise and then made it a habit. So habits aren't bad, relationships aren't bad, narratives aren't bad. It's what they're connected to and why they come about. So that's the neuroscience. Again, Alcoholics Anonymous and their thought process helped us develop that there is a neuroscience. It took the label off of, well, he just doesn't have enough willpower not to drink, or she just doesn't have enough willpower not to eat. It is rarely about willpower. It's never about willpower. Let's be really clear about that. You are eating, drinking, exercising to feed a need that you have decided on. It may be super subconscious, but Alcoholics Anonymous was the first to bring that out and say, look, there's more going on here. Then to step even further, Gaber Mate, who's a Canadian therapist and medical doctor, describes addiction in this way. Addiction is manifested in any behavior that a person craves, finds temporary relief or pleasure in, but suffers negative consequences as a result of the action. And yet they have difficulty giving it up. So let's read this again. Craving is not bad. Pleasure or relief is not bad. It's when you crave it, or find temporary relief in it and pleasure in it, but it causes suffering afterward. And even though it causes suffering, you have difficulty giving it up. So it's the basic idea, we can use sleep. For, for years, we've tried to outrun sleep and we're getting more and more information that sleep is just astronomically important. In fact, driving while sleep deprived is just like drunk driving. That's how serious it is. So 
when we cut our sleep short, even though we might find pleasure in being out with friends, we might find, you know, a temporary uh, relief in getting that project done, getting everything finished, and it, it just had to move into our sleep time, there are negative consequences. They will always catch up with you. Sleep deprivation is huge. As a result, you have difficulty giving it up. So here's the problem. If you have difficulty giving that up, then it may run into a habit. In brief, Mate says, craving, relief, pleasure, suffering, and impaired control follow. That's the difficulty. Note that this definition is not, here's the part that I really like, not restricted to drugs, but could encompass almost any human behavior from sex to eating, to shopping, to gambling, to extreme sports, to TV, to compulsive internet use. The list is endless. And reading Gaber Mate's work is fantastic. One of the areas he used, we would kind of call it shopping, is classical music. So he would, if he was stressed or needed to be someplace or needed to be doing something, he would go and buy more classical music. The story that he tells is fantastic. He's supposed to be delivering a baby. He's not quite getting there. He's feeling stressed out about this. And he finds himself in a store buying classical music albums that he already has. So one, it's a financial problem. Two, it's a professional problem. Three, he is not in alignment with himself and with what he should be doing. Instead, he is trying to relieve stress by this all-consuming consumption or craving for this classical music. Something you'll have to re read about in his book. So these three definitions give you some very different ideas. We've got the disease model, which is Alcoholics Anonymous. We've got the, this is a habit. You have developed a narrative and then a relationship. And then the habit just keeps forming because you've developed this relationship. And then we've also got this behavioral model of cravings that even though this is problematic, you're still doing it. So here's the difference with Dr. Mate's understanding. And I'm gonna read this to you too so you can get the real gist of it. Dr. Monte's approach seems revolutionary to the outside world, but anyone on the inside of addiction can sense that addiction is only a symptom. Even in the disease model, we're still looking at a symptom. What he says is, I'm not going to ask you what you are addicted to. I often say to people, not when nor how long, only whatever your addictive focus, what did it offer you? So not when, not how long, not where did it start? Who did you get it from? Were your parents alcoholics? But the focus of what did it offer you? What is it fixing? What did you like about it? What in the short term did it give you that you craved or liked so much? And universally, the answers are, it helped me escape emotional pain, helped me deal with stress, gave me peace of mind, a sense of connectedness with others, a sense of control. Everyone who chooses to use or ends up using or gets a habit or has a disease model what are they looking for? An escape from emotional pain, dealing with stress, peace of mind, connection with another person, looking at, for a sense of control, or looking to escape. So when you're looking at this, one of the things that you might do with your loved one is look at what happens before the use, whether it's shopping, whether it's eating, whether it's drinking, whether it's buying classical music CDs, what was happening leading up 
to the use and what did they feel they got from doing the addictive behavior. I'd leave you with those thought processes and even more so as the loved one of an addict, what are you doing when they use? What gives you a sense of relief? If you nag and you yell and you get angry, does that release things for you? Or if you storm out of the house, does that release things for you? Or if you ignore it, or if you uh, join them, does that give you a sense of relief? What is happening for you when your addicted loved one is using? Thank you very much for joining me on Sober on Purpose. I really look forward to talking to you. If this is something that you think you could use some help with, please reach out and set up a strategy call. There's a button just above. You can check me out on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and we can connect and do a 15 minute strategy call and see if we can work together. Thank you so much.